Well, welcome to 360 Yield Center. What a pleasure it is to have you stop in. You know, we have a lot of different technology in the tent. We got a lot of white shirts to help explain the different things that we're doing. At the end of the day, though, I'm pretty passionate as a farm family. You manage your inputs, you manage your yield. Yes, weather is a factor. What we're gonna talk about here this morning is how do we manage around that weather? Too much rain, not enough rain, too hot, too, too cold. Those are things that, that we run into. You know though, this is the time of year we start to get combines in. So you're bringing your combines into the shop. It's a great time to think about what are the things we can do at harvest time to gather more in the grain tank. For years I've looked underneath the corn head and I've seen corn coming through the deck plates. And so we have the yield saver that you see here, the brushes on the chains, and it's all about can we save 80% of the loss. So you see this grower here, he's got strips of volunteer corn. It's a 12 row head, six on, six off. And I look at this and this is a scenario that's been out there for years. So 360 yield saver is all about saying let's capture at least 80 percent of that. We got a little demo here, you can see us doing it in front of farmers and we got PVC tubes. We're just dropping shelled corn down over the row, not unlike what you see in the end of the booth and you can see exactly what we captured. And if you weigh it out, it's an 85% savings. So for you and I, I would look for you to look at two bushel per acre in a savings by using Yield Saver. And we're just gonna capture and cushion. I get this question all the time, but Greg, I harvest wetter corn. I don't think that would be near the advantage because I harvest at 25%. I'm showing you a picture here of our custom harvesters in our seed fields. We raise a lot of seed corn. And so you can see he's got yield savers on this deer head. This corn is checking 38%. When you walk behind that ear corn harvester, it was dramatic. What we save by cushioning. So as those ears come down and hit the deck plates and the gathering chains, we cushion and then we capture the loose kernels. And the, the effect at the end of the day, next spring, the volunteer corn in those seed fields was huge difference and so it's something Monsanto's saying this is something we need to put on even when we're harvesting really wet corn. You look underneath that corn head and we got snap and rolls and so we designed a chain roll system for one reason only. I wanted to break down this residue much faster. How long do you think it takes for nature to break this whole corn plant down did you have all the dollars out of this residue for fertilizer value? five years. It takes microbials five years to eat this whole corn stalk. And so I challenged our engineering team and I said design us technology such as this that we can create residue that's chained together but opened up so the microbials will break that down in two years. I wanted to speed up the whole process and with all the trials and things we've been doing I'm really excited about managing residue. The reason we don't make confetti is because row cleaners the following spring, as they come in and work through your seed trench, you cannot have residue in with the seed. If you do, you're going to misfire. So we're always worried about, did your row cleaners clean that environment? If I create a seven inch piece that's this long, my row cleaners can pitch that out of the way. I still opened it up that all the residue gets quickly digested down. So those are things we look at. You can see it here in the tubs, the far left 360 chain roll, the deer intermeshing, and the deer opposed. But this is what tells the story right here. It's what you plan into the following spring. This is what I talk about, managing residue for success. So whether that's going in the beans or corn, look at the difference in the same field side by side with the corn heads. It's pretty dynamic when you look at it and you see the response. You'll notice that behind the bleachers, we got a ripper pit. And years ago, as I was ripping, I was always concerned. I would watch that ripper run, and as that ripper ran, we were always leaving berms. So in other words, we'd come underneath the ground and you'd see this kind of environment. Where the shank went, we would bust it out at 12 inches. But 40% of our soil was still left extremely firm. When you plant a seed in there the next year and the root system comes down, it has to grow around that berm, it can't grow into it. Your N, P, and K here 
is something that you and I need to think about. So we designed a ripper point with 14 inch wings, seven on each side. And it's designed in such a way that you can pull it and it's designed to come in and blow out all the berm. On the bottom side of the photo, you see a ripper that had the case seven inch tiger point. And then you see that we blew it out 12 inches deep. Now roots just grow. And we're in there in a really good environment. And these are things that get me excited. This is a picture of a Michigan grower. He brought the second ripper in the field that had bullets on next to his 875 that had the case points to finish the field. Look at the moisture line right where the bullet ran on the right compared to the OEM on the left. And so when we talk about planting conditions in a spring, this is something that can make quite a difference to you. So I started out by saying how you and I farm can put in quite a difference in the plopability. Profitability comes from management. These two fields are 30 inches apart with no fence row. Planted the same day. Grower on the left is not a bad grower. The grower on the left puts all of his nitrogen on at one time. We call it once and done. And you can see he's got 205 bushel corn. Not a bad yield. The problem that he has is the grower next to him <coughs> managed his nitrogen totally different. He had 50 bushel more. And so you look at this and you say, well, where do I fit in? And how do I manage accordingly? Because you can say, well, the weather went against the guy in the left. Well, wait a minute. The rain didn't stop 30 inches apart. And so these are things that we talk about. How do you and I take responsibility? You know, there's lots of different hybrid choices. We talk about vertical leaf corn, semi-determinate ear, flex ear, 30-inch corn, 20-inch corn, all that that we have out there. At the end of the day, this is where I'm at on it. If you and I can design a farming system that helps take stress out of three areas, early, mid-season, and late, we're going to maximize yields. You talk about early stress. That's when we talk about how many rows around are we going to be. So we think about 18 rows around 16, or a small area of 16. This all comes down to how did we manage the nitrogen applications and how did we perform in that environment. So let's take a look at it. Early on, girth around, rows around, that's with the planter. In the middle, nitrogen depletion in the middle of the growing season, you're going to lose length. Every kernel and length is worth six bushel to you. Then the magic happens at the end. What's happening right here today we have a beautiful sunshine. That plant out there in the field is finishing out a lot of weight in that kernel in today's environment. We're cooler, we're sunny, not a lot of wind. Those are things that make a lot of starch in the kernel itself. So let's take a look at it. Let's talk about in the middle of the season. If we split apply nitrogen, and so you see this young man here, he's coming in head high corn, He's got wide drops running at the bottom of the base of the plant, and he's applying the finish amount to take him to harvest. And you're saying, well, man, Greg, I can almost see tassels coming out in there. Let's talk about his situation. So for years, he did once and done. He would come out as agronomist, as a good agronomist, and so they had a yield goal of 230. We know what, it takes 1.1 bushel, I'm sorry, pounds of N to equal one bushel. And so if his yield goal was 230, he would put on 255 pounds of nitrogen and he would check the box and say, I'm done. And so as you look at this scenario, last year, he did that on part of the field on the right, 100% of the N on pre-plant at 255 because he wanted to hit 230, which by the way, he did in the black line. Well, 229.97, I say, I call that 230. On the other side, he did what we do at 360, and we say put some of it on, and he used the planter, and he put 75 units on. How far was 75 units taking? Head high corn. That'll take him to corn this tall. Why is he waiting? So we talk about waiting, and this is the beauty of what we're saying. We say to manage and use less and raise more. We let nature play its hand. We know what, out in the field, you have a mountain of these little guys. 
We call them microbials, bacteria. How many ton do you think you have in a cornfield? 18 ton, or 36,000 pounds per acre of good bacteria that's giving you free nitrogen. How much? 80 to 100 pounds. This number I really like. So on the right hand side, where he put it all on in the spring, if nature and microbials gave him 100 pounds free, how many dollars did he put in his pocket? He already had it all on. And so I look at that and I say, if you can design a system, and I believe pretty passionately the planter is the perfect place to put in, we know where every row is, put it on each side, and we get that plant off to an early start. Till corn's head tall, it only uses 25% of its total end. After head tall corn, it uses 75% to finish the ear. And so if you look on the other side where he did 75, he weighed it. Then when you saw him in there at the Hagee, he put on another 105 pounds for a total of 180. So 180 pounds of N yielded 241. So he made 11 bushel more and used what, 75 pounds less nitrogen. He told me himself, he said, Greg, I put $80 an acre net into my pocket. And I look at that and I say, this is what we're talking about. No longer do you and I say nature beat us up, but we come in and say, how do we manage accordingly? I think anytime you split nitrogen, you win. So we have Y drops on this sprayer. And you can see here, we got the breakaways and it's all designed that it can come in in the rough ground. And you can see we're going to put the stalk right between these hoses and we're going to dump nitrogen right beside the stalk, right on top of the ground. And there might be some of you say, boy, that, that sounds a little scary. What if it gets dry? Well, we've done the research. We've got plots out that had 49 days with no rain compared to a coulter in the center of the row. And guess what? Six bushel more with the Y drop versus the colder. How's that possible? Well, it's all about yield and take up. So when you compare colder to Y drop and 30 inch corn, we've shown six bushel with the same amount of N, but it's all about timing and placement. To prove that out, we worked with the University of Illinois and Dr. Mulvaney did a nitrogen test with us. He took nuclear nitrogen so you can measure the uptake in each plant. And what they found is that the corn that had Y drop took in 25% more in than the coulter in the center of a 30 inch row, which translates to that six bushel of more response. How about depth of kernel? We talked about it. Every 5,000 kernels, less than 90,000, is 15 bushel more yield. This year at home, we're figuring 90,000 on our kernel checks. When I split those ears open, it's going to be closer to 80 to 75 kernels, 1,000 per bushel. So we're looking at 40 bushel more than we're kernel checking. I've seen it time after time. How do we add that? You look at those two ears. They're the same rows around, but there's going to be a lot of difference in yield, isn't there? And so it comes at the end of the growing season. How do you and I manage diseases? In central Illinois, we got gray leaf like I've never seen it, at least in the last 10 years. The gray leaf is very, very rapid. In our program, we don't flip a coin. I don't say, well, I wonder should we spray fungicide or not? Way, way, way back in January, we did our budget. We put in the $18 an acre for fungicide. It's in the program. Every acre is gonna get sprayed every year. We manage accordingly. We understand the yield that we can take from that. The technology that we use is called undercover. It's got three nozzles that spraying from the bottom up. And so as you look at this undercover and the riser, we're spraying from the bottom up. There's a reason for that. 60% of your leaf openings are on the bottom of the leaf and not on the top. At the same time, I use a top nozzle. So I'm using four nozzles. We're spraying 18 gallons of the acre, every acre, and you can see us here in 12 foot high corn. And we're running 12 mile an hour at 18 gallons of the acre, four nozzles. So we're treating every acre. This is 20 inch corn and he's running 12 mile an hour. And you say, well, how can he control it? Well, if you look at this sprayer here, you see that we have a steering system. And you can see the tactical wands. 
So those wands are running on each side of the stalk down the center of that row. We're running on our AB line. And if the sprayer's getting too far to the right, the wands show us, and we start bumping the AB line over so we keep the sprayer in the sweet spot. I saw Jan one day sent me a text at 18 mile an hour. I know he wasn't having his hands on because he was filming the monitor at 18 mile an hour with auto steer on. And so we understand. This is a, what I call a poor man's auto steer. We cut all the dollars out of it. We use your existing globe. We use your existing power unit, steering box. All we do is change the variables going in the globe itself. You notice on the end of the boom, we got a tail hanging down. So we also introduced last year auto boom height called Glide. So we're going to demonstrate that to you. Barry's going to back up. We'll put this boom down. And we're going to come up and over this mound and show you how the boom activates and how it runs. So we know that when you start doing undercover and wide drop in tall corn, there's a stress there. You run 12 hours a day and you're steering in tall corn or you're trying to keep your booms the right height in tall corn, it's a real challenge. And so I told our engineering team, let's design some simple concepts. Let's use the same exact sonar sensor that they've had. We unplug it and we plug our pack into there and it goes to the monitor. Your monitor looks exactly the same as it always has. Nothing changes. So we're gonna set him here at 14 inches above the ground. So we get him set here, he'll get her down and he'll take over. So now Glide's taking over and it's starting to react. He's on his AB line, so I don't think he's gonna hit us. You're gonna see the tail, start, as it starts to come up, it's constantly reading and it's saying, I wanna be 14 inches. So as it comes up here, the boom's gonna to start to come up. So you can see it there. You see the boom starting to rise. As he comes down, it's gonna to start to come down. Now obviously we're running pretty slow. Our field's pretty short here. So if I go out there and grab that tail and I raise up on it, the boom's gonna go up. So the sensor's gonna say, okay, ground's coming to me. If I take it down, it's going to come right down again. So you can see there some of the simple concepts we say, how do you and I manage in a lot of acres per day and not wear ourselves down? Let's bring the planner out. We'll talk about some different concepts. So we talk about early stress. And I already mentioned that I want to eliminate stress every time that I possibly can. And so early in that plant's life, a lot of things happen. You know, when we select rows around, I've never seen it when it's selected 16, that it would go to 18. I've seen a lot of 18s go to 16, but I've never seen it in any other way. So when we talk about early stress, we're talking about adding rows by keeping happy corn. So let's bring him by here and we'll talk about it. Now we know that roots just grow the same anywhere in the world. So we got farmers right now in the booth here from Argentina. We got them from every state here in the country. When you plant corn, roots just grow the same. And that's a beautiful thing. If you're in the design business like we are, and we're saying we're going to put nitrogen on the planter, to know where the root system is, is a real advantage. So no matter where you live, we come out here and we're going to plant this corn. And we plant them in here. Of course, you're going to get some little seeding roots. Mesocalo starts to come up, we put on a crown. It's always three quarters of an inch below ground. It's the same no matter what. And then that plant starts to grow up. As it starts to grow, we start to think about what happened. How long do you think the seed provides for that baby corn plant? Because there's no root system for quite some time. So till V5, I'm talking corn boot high, there's not a root system feeding it. It's living off the starch and mama seed. Well, here's the problem. If you and I at V5, guess what else that plant's doing? The very same time it starts to hand off the feeding system to the new crown roots coming out is exactly when it's setting on how many rows around it's going to have. If you go in your field and you go home and you pull back your husk and you don't see your corn from the butt to the tip line up, if you told me it scrambled right here, it's 18 in the bottom, went to 16. I'm telling you, you stressed it somehow. 
It could be really bad weather, probably not. It could be a sidewall compaction, your roots couldn't grow, could be. Most times it's nitrogen. When it senses that it's going to run out of N and it's starting to struggle, it's then going to set on less rows around. So if it went from 18 to 16, that's 20 bushel, you and I lost. So if we're going to design starter, I'm sorry, nitrogen on the planter, we're going to come three inches over both ways, and we're just going to go and put it three quarters of an inch below ground. There's a reason. I know how much force, when we designed Delta Force, we knew exactly how much force it took to put a disc opener in at an inch and three quarter. That's 200 pounds. If you told me you want your nitrogen wheels to be two inches deep, that's going to add another two discs. Now you're up to 600 pounds of downforce to get to an inch and three quarters. You're probably going to start to float your bar, depending on how many row units you got on. So we said, no, 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 no. Let's go shallow because let's use nature. The minute you start to get any moisture at all, this nitrogen starts to migrate down. And it moves easily through the profile. And we start to lessen the salt impact. We're using 32%. We're putting on 70 units, which is 23 gallon plus sulfur. Anytime I put N on, whether it's with Y drop, the planter, I use a 10 to 1 ratio. 25 gallon of 32%, 2.5 gallon of a thiosol. So it's always a 10 to 1 ratio. And so the minute these crown roots start to grow out, and we're handing the baton over from this seed here that died immediately we have to have really happy corn. And this is where you and I got to understand. Soybeans, radically different. We intentionally stress beans at R1, R2 so that we produce more beans. You don't ever stress corn. You stress corn at the wrong time, you're going to change the length, you're going to change the kernel weight, or you're going to change rows around. And so nitrogen becomes a real key to us. The beautiful thing about this is a band of nitrogen is 2x the value of broadcast. If you told me right now you're broadcasting 120 units of 28 in chemical, you could go to 60 units with a band and feed the corn accurately. Because we know you've got all these little microbials in here that are going to start feeding on that nitrogen. The minute you got a band, you're going to be much safer. These guys are going to grow and feed and break down residue. That's their job. They use nitrogen to do that. How many times have you seen this? You're planting corn, and it's, let's say, in the low 70s. All of a sudden, you get an 85-degree weekend, three days in a row. How many times have you seen three to four days later, on Monday morning, from Friday to Monday, you see corn start to turn pale, and it starts to yellow out on you? What's happening? Microbials, population, triple, double, times 10, times 100, they're feeding on all the in, and that little corn plant's starting to run out. So we really like the fact that a planter's a free pass. I'm going to plant corn anyway. Once I know where every seed is, now I can position nitrogen to win. And that's what this is about. We talk about designing equipment that does no harm. And so when you think about that open seed V, if these discs would ever close that seed trench from the top down, you're going to have dry dirt on seed. So we leave an open trench. We let the closing wheels do its work, and then we incorporate a chain. I'm a huge proponent of chains on planters. They will cover up a multitude of problems that you and I create. A chain coming along there, if you hit a damp spot and you don't get full closure, that chain will take all that problem away. And so it's something we really think about and we utilize. Watch it run here. It's got the ability to be spring-loaded. It can come up and over rocks. You hit hard ground, instead of the planter coming up, the nitrogen is going to start to give up some. And so by design, it's designed to come in at high speeds. Like I said, I would put 40% of my nitrogen on at the planter, and then I would move from there. You can see here where we did corn on beans and corn on corn broadcast versus bandit. It becomes pretty evident that a band is going to outperform the broadcast by the tune of 19 bushel. And so on the bean side, not as much residue. It was half the different bushels. And so those are things that we watch. But it begs the question, how about starter? Last year we introduced here a starter system called DASH. 
Dash come in and did what? It took 50% of your cost out of the program. I would tell you that starter is going to add 15 bushel to your corn profitability and yield. Where does it come from? Early. What's the number one question I get about starter fertilizer? Greg, if it costs 28 to 30 dollars an acre, and we're in a three dollar corn market, how can I afford to put starter on? And I look at starter different than most. We have a fall plow down program, and we know how much P and K we're going to put on. I back out my next spring starter out of my application in the fall. I shift it around to the spring because I want to out the gate an early run. Think of it this way. Until your soils get to 65 degrees, day-long temperatures, soil temperature is 65, that little corn root cannot find any phosphorus. That phosphorus is tied up till soils get over 65. You and I have a lot of 55 degree soils for the first three weeks of that corn plant's life. So I'm all about getting pea into that plant early. We know that if we do, we're gonna have drier corn. I can probably take, I'm gonna make a wild guess, five days of maturity difference. If I planted 112 day corn and you planted 108 day corn, I think we would harvest the same time if I used starter and you didn't. We can shorten up that, we get much quicker out the gate, and we get that plant off and running in a really good state. So this is what we did for years. You come out and you put starter on from fence row to fence row, and it's gonna cost you that $30. We said, well, why wouldn't we, with the right technology, if we could design a valve that every time it saw a seed and it knew where that seed was, we could put out 50% of the product or three inches. So if this is six inches between seed, or even what if we could just put two inches versus three inches out, how would that look? The plots on this are really exciting. The data looks phenomenal. I am pumped. We will have beta planters out next year with Dash where we're, where we're going out there and we're gonna be able to show you exactly what it looks like. But this begs the question, if we're gonna to start to put liquid on planters, where are you gonna carry it? So, I never thought I would design tanks, but at the same time, I want you to start thinking about where do you put nitrogen? So these are 700 gallon tanks. They're designed to go over the front wheels. They carry more weight on the rear than if it was all out front. The main thing is it's narrow. I want it really good visibility, and I don't want my heart rate to go over 120 when I'm taking my planter down the road. And so we all understand traffic, and so we designed a narrow tank that fits within the wheels, the dimension of the wheels, carries 700 gallon, and he got good visibility in between. So on our farm, we run three larger planters, and they're high speed planters, so I wrote a pretty big check to get planters to high speed. And then I see that I'm sitting 10 times a day, I back up to the road bank, and I have a driver there of a nurse tank, and we're nursing nitrogen and starter that planter. On the best days, we can do it at 12 minutes. See, in my mind, and it's a figment of my imagination, when I'm coming towards the truck and I'm about empty, I call him, and I say, we're gonna load this time. To me, that means you start the truck, you move it ahead, so when I turn on my AB line, all I do is back up. You are out of the truck, the motor is running, you have the three inch hose like NASCAR, and you're waiting for Greg to back up, it never happens. I back up, I jump out of the tractor, I run around, and Fred is just getting out of the truck, and he starts pulling on the motor. By that time, I got the hose hooked up, and I said, let her go, Fred. Finally, the motor starts, and I said, let her go, and nothing's coming. And I look back at him, he says, I forgot to open the valve. He trucks around the back of the semi, and he jacks the valve open, and I'm like, I spent a lot of money to be planting more acres on the right day. So there's a 30% efficiency gain, and so I challenged our team, and I said, if we're gonna put starter on a lot of planters, we gotta make this seamless, we gotta make this easy. So we run grain carts of combines, we've done it for years, and combines never stop. So I go to our engineering team and Tim and I say, why are we not bringing nitrogen to the planter just like we take corn from the combine. So you can see here a gator running with 300 gallon of pick your poison, starter, nitrogen, 
and he's going to come in and engage. And now he's pumping. In three minutes time, he comes in here. You can see this is our seed corn planter. It's a 26 row planter. He's coming in behind here. He's going to engage right on the end. His wheel spacing is not on top of the corn. It's right in the row. And so you can see here, he's now pumping 300 gallon over and he's going to run right back out to the road bank and load up the next 300 gallon. So let's take a look at this and see what it looks like. We'll go ahead and demonstrate that. We'll bring the gator out. And we don't have a very long fence, very long rows here. So we're going to pump water for 50 feet and we'll blow it. So you can see he's hauling 300 gallon. He's going to come right in the planter. He's going to engage. Once he's engaged, you can see that the hose is hooked. He's going to start his pump. So it take, like I said, we're going to pump about 100 gallon a minute or a little faster. He's pumping water here. You're going to see his hand go down to hit the air switch. He's going to blow that line. He's blowing it right now. See the hose jerk? You can see that we put pressure on it. He comes up and unhooks. And he's going to immediately turn around and head back to the truck to load. Planner's going to continue to plan. So we're looking for ways to say, how do you and I become better? I would say it this way. For our farm family to be profitable, it's up to me to manage our inputs to raise more. We can't look at weather and blame it. And so at the end of the day, I want you to have corn that looks like this. Lots of ears. I want corn pollinated out within three quarters of the end. I want the rows on that ear to line up from the tip to the butt and not scrambled. And I want the plants that you see in the background to be really, really healthy.